Good evening, and welcome to Full Moon Matinee. I'm your host, The Detective, bringing you the finest crime dramas and film noir from the golden age of Hollywood. Tonight's picture is from 1952, Without Warning, starring Adam Williams, Meg Randall, Edward Benz, and Harlan Ward. And it is a noir that is also part police procedural. And we do have those classic voiceovers in various scenes throughout the picture. And its storyline is very simple. It's about a killer on the loose who is targeting attractive blonde women. And the only thing known about the killer is that he is using a scissors-like instrument. And, of course, the manhunt is on. Now this picture admittedly does not feature a particularly well-known cast, but it has a couple of interesting stories behind it. One, it was directed by Arnold Laban and it was produced by Arthur Gardner and Jules Levy. The three of them met while they were serving in the army together during World War II. They were in its first motion pictures unit and basically their job mostly was to make training films for the army. Shortly after the war, they formed their own production company, Levy Gardner Laban in 1951. And tonight's picture was distributed by Saul Lesser. Another interesting thing about this picture is that after it was released and made its run through the theaters, it was considered a lost film for decades. It was what you would call a lost film. So it was never commercially released, you know, like reel-to-reel -reel or VHS tapes, until a copy of it finally turned up and they it was released as a DVD in the year 2005. So what we have here is something of a rare find. So, from 1952, without warning. Let's roll the picture. of crime in any great city, there is always one case that for sheer savagery will never be forgotten. No professional criminal could ever match its fury, for it is the record of murder without reason, of fear and of terror, of a killer who strikes without warning. <laughs>
This is a quiet spot. This is the manager. You'll have to turn off that radio. The other guests are complaining. I said turn off that radio. Well, I'll come in and do it for you. That'll do it, Joe. We're all through, Don. Right. Hello, Don. Everything under control? Just waiting for you, Pete. Hello, Pete. Glad you're here. We're ready to move the body. What time did it happen? About 3 o'clock. Multiple stab wounds in the back. Here, take a look. Weapon was a long, sharp, twin-bladed object. Scissors of some kind. Remind you of anything? Body of the waitress we found about a month ago. That's how I figured. Probably the same guy. We should know for sure after the autopsy. I'll wait for your call. Okay, boys, you can wrap it up. Any identification on the body? Yeah, a driver's license. Mrs. Alma Johnson, 28, 60, 10 and a half Franklin Avenue. The car's out front, it's that green Chevy. Now, what time was the register signed? 1.30, according to this. She signed as Mr. and Mrs. Joe Green of San Diego. The manager didn't see anyone else. He's outside when you want to talk to him. Okay. What about the fingerprints? They're all over the place. He's just finishing up now. Fine. As soon as they're processed, we'll check the file. Anything else? The usual. Bud matches a few cigarettes. His or hers? Hers, unless they both wore lipstick. Huh. Also, I found some stuff under her nails. And here's something else. What is it? Looks like a piece of suit fabric. Blue serge. Get it down to the lab and tell Charlie we'll drop by as soon as we can, all right? Right. Where's the girl's husband? We're trying to find him. Fine. Now, we better send out a call to pick up every 288 and 311 we can lay our hands on. Let's go see the manager. Huh? While the killer slept, the machinery of the law slipped into gear. They checked the fingerprints found at the scene of the crime. If the killer had ever been arrested, his prints would be on file. There was no record of them anywhere. They located the victim's husband and brought him in to identify the body. He'd been working all night and hadn't even known his wife was on the loose. Police details moved throughout the city. They picked up any man who had ever been connected with a crime similar to the murder in the motel. The suspects were taken to the identification room. They were booked, printed, and mugged. It was a mixed assortment of the mild and the defiant. That was the routine, and it went on all night. Meanwhile, in homicide, they went after the case from another angle. That's the way I see it. The victim was attacked from the back and stabbed repeatedly in the body with a twin-bladed object like that. That's the same man, all right. Are you sure about the type of weapon? Sure, I'm sure. I'll show you. Here are the photographs we took last night. Notice the position and frequency of the wounds. And here are the ones we took of that waitress a month ago. The wounds are identical. 
In each case, they were made by a thick kind of scissors about five inches long. At least he's consistent. Anything else, Doc? Just what you already know. Both victims were blonde and had alcohol in their systems. Don, let's have a couple of dozen photographs of the Johnson woman made up right away. And see how many men Brownie can lend us to canvas the bars. If they show the pictures to enough bartenders, one of them ought to come up with a lead. Right, I'll see you back here. Now, you better make it the lab. I want to talk to Charlie. If you get any ideas on the type of scissors, Doc, let me know. I'll do that, Pete. There's a couple of days Of course, the square inch of fabric isn't much to go on. But it may tell us a few things. Manufacturer? Possibly. We can trace the mill that made the material. What makes you so positive it's from the killer suit in the first place? I'm not positive, but we have to start somewhere. We tried to check everybody that was registered in the motel room in the past week. And? And what do you think? 75% of the names were phony. Well, that's par for a motel. You wouldn't say you were playing a long shot, would you? Now, what do you want me to do? Assign a man to every motel in town just to be sure that the guests sign their right names? Relax. You'll put them all out of business. <laughs> okay, okay. What'd you find? It's from his suit, all right. The threads match the traces of wool lint found under the dead girl's fingernails. She must have put up a pretty good fight. Take a look. All right. Now, the main thing is the number of horizontal strands to the weave. I'd say about 80 to the inch and 100 fibers to the strand. For surge, that's pretty good. I just saw Brownie. It's all set. How many men is he going to let us have? Eight tomorrow. More later if we need him. We'll need him, all right. About this material, how much would you say it cost? Well, it isn't cheap. Couldn't touch a suit like that for under 90 or or $100. Anything else? Yeah, it's quite new. Very resilient. The fibers have all the bounce of a new handball. Another thing. There are no signs of cleaning fluid. All right, so the suit's new. It'll take months to track down everybody who's bought a blue serge suit recently. Would you like to borrow my microscope? If you had a brand new $100 suit with a small tear in it, what would you do? Give it to the Salvation Army? No, I take it to one of those French weaving places. Don. Coffee? Don. Will you have a bulletin sent out to every shop in town that does mending and weaving? Warn them to be on the lookout for a blue serge suit with a tear in it. I'll take care of it right away. Good morning, Mr. Martin. Hi, Carmelita. See my hospital? Well, who's it for? Maria. What happened to her? Oh, we're playing and she broke her neck. Can you fix it, Mr. Martin? Oh, I think so. There, she's as good as new. 
Hey, what are you doing with that package? What's in it? Let me see, please. Hi, Fred. Say, listen, do you think you can put a coupling on the end of this for me? Sure. Anything else today? Oh, I need a couple hundred pound sacks of Vigoro. Mm -hmm. And about uh, 10 pounds of clover seed. Okay. the girl? Well, that's my daughter, Jane. She came down from Fresno to live with me. I think I mentioned her to you. Oh. Is she gonna be here long? Only till her husband gets back. He's been sent overseas. Dad? You're waiting on the phone. Okay, honey. Jane, this is Carl Martin. Hello, Carl. How do you do? Here, let me help you. Within six hours of the murder, the killer was back tending flowers as part of his normal daily routine. At the same time, Homicide was working on the one good remaining lead, the torn blue suit. Skilled detectives canvassed every tailor shop in town. On the bulletin they left with each tailor was all the information plus a central police number. The plan was simple. If the suit were brought in for repair, the trap could be sprung within the quarter hour. The next move was up to the killer. First of all, lady, I can fix it, but it'll show, and, and this is too good a skirt for that. A friend of mine had a tear in her dress and she took it someplace and had it mended and it didn't even show where the work was done. So why can't you mend my skirt? Look, lady, when material is burned or a piece is ripped out like this, there's nothing you can do. When you ripped it out, you left a piece behind. You see, there's a piece of material missing. Look, you can see for yourself it doesn't fit together. Now, I have to take the rest from your hand. Three weeks. We know. 
Haven't you fellas got a theory, a hunch, something to get us out of this? All right, see what you think of this. We have a kind of a theory based on the pattern in these two cases. A pattern? It's a time pattern, mostly. Mrs. Rollins was killed March the 3rd, approximately 3.30 a.m. Mrs. Johnson at 3 o'clock in the morning on April the 2nd. That's right. Both early in the month. Maybe he likes the position of the moon then. Or maybe he gets paid at the end of the month and he likes to wait until he has enough money to go out in style. I don't know. Pete, it's the end of the month now. Yeah, I know. And if our theory is correct, you can tell them that the department is going to have another dead woman on its hands. And soon. You, Carl. Is your father here? No, he isn't. Is there something I can do for you? No, I don't think so. All right, Carl. Excuse me, won't you? What do you think of the way I butted this Hoover under the California? It's not bad for an amateur, is it? It's very good. How do you like working here for your dad? Well, it takes my mind off Jerry, and it keeps me from being too lonesome. Say, Carl. Do you see a pair of pruning shears over there someplace? can tell Dad for you? Well, one of my customers asked me for a rare tropical plant. I thought maybe your father could help me. Want me to give you a good suggestion? Okay. Why not a Cattleya orchid? I understand with proper care they do very well around here. Have you got one in stock? Well, no. Dad sends to Hawaii for them. However, this is the right season. We ought to be able to get one in a couple of weeks. Is that too long? Well, he said there was no rush. Order one for me, will you? All right, Carl. Thanks for the suggestion. Not at all. Goodbye. Don't do any better than you did last week. Don't come home at all. You sure you don't want to come along? No, Dad. I think I'll stay and finish the books. Okay. Well, I'll have the sprinkler on. Turn it off in about 15 minutes, huh? All right, Dad. Good night. Here this time of night. 
I was just passing. I saw the light on. I thought I'd pay my bill. Oh. Well, that'll save me having to mail it out to you. How come you're not watching Fred Bowe? Well, this is his regular night, isn't it? Yes, but if I don't get these bills out, he won't have enough money to bowl. Let's see. Here's your account, Carl. You owe us exactly thirty-four forty-five. Yeah, that's right. Are you going to work very late tonight? Well, I have to get out all these bills. You got a way of getting home? Oh, I usually hop the bus at the corner. It's just a short ride. I'll be glad to wait for you. I have my car. Well, that's very sweet of you, Carl, but I wouldn't want you to waste your evening waiting around for me. <laughs> I don't mind waiting. I have nothing better to do. We might even stop somewhere and have a drink. Let's see, that's thirty-four fifty, thirty-five. I don't know what time I'll be getting off, Carl. It's still early. Do you often have this kind of trouble with your car? No. This hasn't happened for a long time. I'll do what I can. I'd appreciate it. No 
wonder it won't start. The ignition key is off. Well, what do you know? Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? I do all right. Now you're going to buy me that drink? All right. If you can't think of anything better to do. I can think of something better. I better go down and check. What are you doing down here? Well, you know how it is, officer. Don't you know you're not allowed to park here? We were just leaving, but I got stuck. All right, I'll give you a hand. What's the matter with her? I'm afraid she had too much to drink. She dozed off. Dozed off? Get out while I take a look at her. Sure. Go ahead.
Hey, taxi. Union Station. KMA 367. About 30, six feet tall, 175 pounds, gray flannel suit, no hat. Sorry, Pete, but that's the best I could do. I never really got a good look at him. He said his behavior seemed normal. Well, it did at the time, but I... Okay, we'll call you when we need you at the lineup. I got the report on the fingerprints. Yeah? It's our man, all right. How you doing, Sam? Okay, there's his right foot. Let's have a look at it. Got a good left foot, too. We'll check him with Charlie. We're finished here. Can I fix it for you later, honey? Don't forget. He wears a nine and a half piece shoe. Same size I wear. Well, here's something a little more interesting. These are the cigarette butts found at the motel murder site a month ago. And these are the ones found in and around the car this morning. Now, do you notice anything peculiar? They all have lipstick markings, and there are about twice as many short ones as long ones. That's right. Take a look. Notice the lipstick on the long one to your right. It's uneven and spread pretty thin. Now look at the short one. It's almost twice as thick. In each case, the murdered woman smoked the short one, but she lipped the long one in her own mouth and then passed it over to him. Excuse me. Hello, Wilkins speaking. Pete? Yeah, he's here. Okay, I'll tell him. I want you down at the Central Produce Market. They have a guy who thinks he saw your man. Let's go, Don. In the turmoil and confusion of the market, the killer's flight had gone unnoticed, except for one man who thought he'd seen him cross the street and hail a taxi. Detectives then checked every cab office in the city. At each one, they received the same reply. No fare picked up in that area. For all his carelessness, the killer had been swallowed up in the trackless jungle of the city. And out of that jungle, as the notoriety increased, came the creatures. Strange, forgotten souls, eager to confess to crimes they did not commit. In their desire to bask briefly in the spotlight of the headlines, they were willing to admit to anything. Each day brought new confessions and still more versions of how the crime had been committed.
And so the admissions of guilt continued. Every cop on the beat had at least one habitual whom he could count on to confess to any and every crime. It was time-taking, discouraging work. But every story had to be checked, every letter and phone call investigated. There was always the chance that this one might be it. The only one who enjoyed it was the killer. It became evident they needed more than a physical description to pin him down. They had to get inside his brain to see what made him tick. To try and determine in advance what his moves would be, they consulted Dr. Werner, the police psychiatrist, authority on the criminal mind. Well, I'll say that homicidal maniacs fall pretty much into three categories. There's the sadistic psychopath, the epileptic equivalent, and the paranoic. Now let's consider the sadistic psychopath first. Now you'll recall, no doubt, that the wounds inflicted on all three parties were pretty much alike. According to the coroner's reports, any one of these wounds might have caused death immediately. There was no real attempt to torture. So I think we can forget about sadistic psychopaths. Good enough. Then let's consider the epileptic equivalent. He kills in frenzied pits and seizures at unpredictable times. His methods are varied and irregular. Now, according to the motorcycle officer who saw him, your man was perfectly calm. And the records indicate a possible time pattern in his attacks and regularity in his methods. Which leaves us the paranoic. And I think he's the man you're after. Now, to illustrate my point, let's take a brief case history. Well, I won't say it's his, but it might be. A boy who is emotionally too weak. Maybe without parents or friends or family. He's lost, nobody to hold on to. But he finally finds a wife or a girl and becomes entirely dependent on her. Well, she turns out to be no good, but he still clings to her. But then one day she runs off with another man who shows her a good time. And the boy is desperate because he finds himself lost again. He suffers a tremendous shock, and that does it. His world collapses, and he has to get even. The balance of his mind tips so that his emotions are transferred to a pathological desire for revenge on the girl or her prototype. Blondes, under 30, about the same height and weight. And he'll keep on killing the same type of girl until you catch him. And so they had a little more to work with, especially when the psychiatrist's information dovetailed with their first real break. A Glendale cabbie remembered picking up a fare at the produce market on the morning of the murder. He'd been afraid to talk before. There's a local ordinance that prohibits out-of-town cabs from picking up a fare inside city limits. Lieutenant Hamilton? Yeah, that's right, that's me. My name is Jackson. I'm with the Rapid Transit Hello. Cab Company. That's uh, Sergeant Ward. Glad to know you, Sergeant. Oh. I've got some information for you fellas, but it's got to be off the record. It'll be off the record. Forget it. It's about this crazy killer you guys are after. Sit down. Thank you. I'm at the produce market one day on my regular beat, and I'm picking up a guy, see? It's a funny thing about this guy. I drop him off at the Union Station. I'm pulling up for a stoplight at the corner. I'm lighting up a cigarette, and I take a look behind me, and I see this guy making a beeline for a different cab. What kind of a cab? A yellow. Yellow. You sure? Yeah. Hello again. Now, we see here, early in the picture, it was mentioned that Jane's husband is serving in the army overseas. Now, for a picture made in 1952, that likely would have meant Korea during the Korean War. But it is certainly a very suspenseful picture. I mean, I'm watching this, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. <laughs> okay. Now, Adam Williams, and he's the one playing Carl, you know, the killer. He was born in Wall Lake, Iowa, but grew up in New York City. He served during World War II as a Navy pilot, 
and he earned the Navy Cross, you know, one of the highest awards you can earn. He earned the Navy Cross flying a dive bomber off of the carrier, the USS Wasp. Uh, he did it, uh, he, he attacked a, a Japanese oiler ship, and upon return, he had to ditch his plane, but without any casualties to the crew. So, he was certainly a, a very accomplished pilot, and when he wasn't acting, he also worked as an accident examiner for the FAA. Now, he also, uh, he did a number of, he, he appeared in a number of episodes of TV series throughout the 1950s and 60s. But some of the notable films that he appeared in, he was in Vice Squad, he was in that with Edward G. Robinson, The Big Heat, in both of those films were noirs. He was in Fear Strikes Out. Now, that one is a particular favorite of mine because I'm a huge baseball fan. And Fear Strikes Out, uh, in that he had the role of a psychiatrist, and that picture was basically the Jimmy Pearsall story. Jimmy Pearsall was a famous baseball player in the 1950s and 60s, and he had some mental issues that he needed treatment for, and that picture was basically his story. Adam Williams, he also appeared in The Space Children. Now that one was a science fiction picture in which he had a lead role. And he also appeared in Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. He was in that with Cary Grant and James Mason. So let's get back to Without Warning. Here it is. I knew we'd have it somewhere. Cab number 803. Picked up a fare at 605 at Union Station. Drove him to 4th and Hamilton. Thanks. Sure. Let me see. She does look a little familiar. But I see so many faces, it's hard for me to... Try think. and think. I am trying. Yeah. I remember now. There was a dame in here looked like that. Only a little blonder, I think. She was in here for a couple of hours, gave some guy the come on, and left. It was pretty late, I think. And he went out after her. What kind of a guy? What did he look like? Oh, just an average sort of guy, I guess. After all, it's been about a month, and a lot of other guys have been in here since. Don't you remember anything about him? His suit, maybe? Yeah. It was dark brown. No, kind of a blue, I think. Thanks. Or was it, uh... So from now till the end of the operation, you're all assigned to us for special duty. Each of you has been chosen because of a close resemblance to the type of woman this man is likely to go for. It's your job to see that he does go for you. We've been able to figure his range of operations to an area within a radius of 15 miles. We've also classified the bars where he's likely to pick up his next victim. He's expected to strike in the next few days. Now for procedure. A plain clothesman will be detailed to each of you. You will never be out of his sight. You've just been given a good general description of the criminal on those cards. Don't waste time on anybody who doesn't match. When you have what appears to be a suspect, play him along until he makes a definite move. Then, signal your detective to make the arrest. What would you call a definite move? Well, you'll have to decide that for yourself. We won't have the time of the men to pull in everybody who makes a friendly pass. On the other hand, always remember that you may be dealing with a homicidal maniac. The criminal seems to have a habit of letting the woman light a cigarette for him in her own mouth. Watch for that. Now, Don will give you your definite assignments. Well, better year first, you go with Sergeant Lewis. And Ginny, I'm going to tag along after you.
that's a good idea. I like the beach when it isn't so crowded. Let's go. Hey, what's the big idea? I'm a police officer. You're under arrest. Under arrest? What for? I haven't done anything. What about it, Betty? Book them on 836-3. You heard the lady. Let's go. Look, like I told you, I just stopped in for a drink after the show. I tell you, you got me wrong. I'm a happily married man. Look, that's fine. I bet your wife's proud of you. You gotta believe me. I, I never had any trouble with the police before in all my life. I never been in jail before. Nothing like this ever happened to me before. Oh, a couple of traffic tickets, things like that, but... Okay, you can go. Honestly, officer, you gotta believe me. I'm telling you the truth. You can go. I know, but you don't understand. Oh. Well, now I can go. You bring me, you bring me all the way down here, and you fingerprint me, and you, you embarrass me, and then you tell me I can go home. Well, I got a half a mind to sue the city for false arrest. You wouldn't really do that. I wouldn't. Don't kid yourself, bud. I know my rights. You're not going to push me around, you flat-footed. You want to be jailed as a public nuisance? Oh, no, sir, I... Just a squad car to deliver him to his front door. If he gives you any trouble, make sure his wife finds out why we brought him home. Thank you, sir. They weren't all quite so innocent. The next night, they picked up some parole violators carrying guns. They're back where they can't use them now. But it took time to pull every suspect in for printing and mugging, and time was running out. From now on, the girls would have to take greater risks. Let the potential killer show his hand more before they signaled for help. So that's the whole story. Twice a month he goes away on a business trip. And, and leaves you home to twirl your thumbs. It's not so bad. At least I get to meet a lot of interesting people this way. I bet you do. How about another drink? What are we wasting our time around here for? I don't know. Come on, let's go. Go to sleep right here. Why don't you? to getting here.
don't you turn in here? Why not? This will teach you there's still some guys who respect another man's home. file on those three suspects the girls brought in last night. Anything important? We turned one of them over to robbery. Prince matched some from a liquor store hold up last week. The other two are in the clear. I still think what happened to Virginia last night's a classic. Driving a girl up in the hills just to give her a lecture on morals. Lieutenant Hamilton. Yeah? When? Right, hold the car. We'll be right down. I just found a blonde in the riverbed. Stabbed to death. Andy work is familiar, all right. Who discovered the body? A couple of kids playing in the water. You touch anything? They didn't hang around long enough to touch anything. What do you got, John? One of my car, these men picked this up about 30 feet from the body. It's the only thing they've found so far. What do you think? What do you think? I don't know. But we'll find out. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Pete. 
What do you got? Plenty. You'd be surprised what you can find in an old spring. Keep talking. It's from the murder weapon, all right. Fresh blood all over it. Signs of older blood, too. This baby's been used before. Probably three times before. What's it from? Garden shears. That ties in. You see this? Yeah, what is it? Nitrate of soda. Urea. Ammonium phosphate. Now, these are all basic ingredients of commercial fertilizer. We've analyzed a few surface crystals, and we'll get the complete formula eventually. Anything else? Well, we're just getting started. Take a look. Wood fibers from the bark of some small tree or bush. We're still checking. Nice work, Charlie. You guys delight me. Well, sometimes we even delight ourselves. Oh, one more thing before you go. This guy must have gotten around quite a bit. We have evidence of three different types of soil. What do you mean, one more thing? Just give me a breakdown on each type. Right here. When the breakdown disclosed that the three types of soil found in the spring came from different sections of the city, they knew that gardening was not the killer's hobby. It had to be his profession. With that information to go on, the clues began to add up. The first step was to find the exact make of garden shears used as the murder weapon. It meant a rundown of every hardware store, supply house, and distributor of garden tools. It was a lot of legwork, but it had to be done. Somewhere in the city, there was a pair of shears that the spring would fit. In the laboratory, analyzing the components of the fertilizer identified with the murder weapon called for a different routine. Not as much running around, but plenty of midnight oil burning. Eventually, they were able to break down the specimen solution to the exact chemical formula. From there, it was a simple step to determine the brand name. present for you. So we finally made it. That's an efficient little thing. Where'd you find it? Trendle Tool Company. Here's a list of their distributors. I didn't know there were this many hardware stores in the world. What about nurseries? About a hundred of them, Pete. We'll try a shortcut. There's no guarantee that our man buys his tools and fertilizer at the same place, but we might as well check the places selling both products first. Good morning, Carl. Hi, Mr. Kent. Did you find out about that plant we discussed, the orchid plant? The Catalia? Well, it hasn't come in yet. You said there was no rush. Oh, but that was some time ago. My wife's birthday is the 10th of this month. Well, it ought to arrive any day, sir. I don't want to disappoint Mrs. Kent. Be sure it's planted by then, Carl. I'll see you it is, sir. By the 10th. Yes, I know it's important. Well, I'm sure it'll be in by then. All right, I'll do what I can. Goodbye. Who was that? It was Carl Martin. He's worried about the Cattleya orchid we ordered for him. It's all my fault. I told him it would be in by now. Well, you better call the express office again. All right, Dad. That's funny. What's the matter? Our honeymoon picture's gone. Sure you didn't take it home with you? No, it was right there on top of the safe. It must be around here somewhere. Here, honey. I'm going to make your call. I'll help you look for it. All right. There never was a good shortcut to a killer. They found that out. 87 places handled both the make of shears and the fertilizer they were after. 20 of them in the valley alone. 
they checked those first and drew 20 blanks. It was the same routine time and again. Find the outlet, question the manager, cross the place off the list. Well, I'm terribly sorry, Carl. They promised me they'd deliver it today. I know tomorrow's too late, but sometimes they do make an extra delivery in the afternoon. I know I feel awful about it. Well, isn't there some other plant we... Got here. Yes, it's a shame. You know, Carl wanted it for first thing in the morning. Hope he drops in before we close. Say, maybe I ought to deliver it. Where does he live? You think he should? I'll be back before closing time. What's his address? It's in the book. All right, you finish watering and I'll go look it up. Okay, honey. one is next? Uh, Saunders Nursery. wondering where you were. You didn't look very hard. Didn't you hear me call you from the house? No. What were you doing there? Well, I have good news, Carl. The Cat Leo work had arrived. Well, that's great. Let's go in and look at it. Well, I can't right now. Dad's all alone and I have to get back. Well, it'll only take a minute. All right, Carl. 
just for a minute. Hello. You the manager of this place? That's right. What can I do for you? We'd like a little information. Be right with you as soon as I turn off this water. It's very nice. Thanks for bringing it up. That's all right. I'm just glad it arrived in time. So, now if you'll excuse me, I do have to go. Why don't you stay and have a cup of tea? Really, Carl, I can't. You mean you won't? No, it isn't that. It's just that I have to get back. Why don't you just sit down? Gentlemen, what do you want to know? You sell this make of shears and Vigoro fertilizer, is that right? Yeah, I have been for some time. Why? You recall selling a pair of these shears or that brand of fertilizer to a man approximately six feet tall, 175 pounds, brown hair, about 30 years of age. Let me think. Eh? He's probably a gardener. I don't. Six feet tall. Young and six feet tall. Kind of sounds like Carl Martin. Why do you want to know? Well, it's nothing serious. We just want to ask him some questions. Oh. Well, I know he uses Vigoro. Uh, what about the shear? I sold it with some of his tools. I'd have to check the books. It'd take me some time. Go ahead. OK. First company I've had since I've lived here. In that case, I am sorry I can't stay any longer. It's not the kind of place you invite a girl to. I don't know. There's no reason not to. No? Have you taken a good look around? Yeah, he, he bought a pair of shears about four months ago. That's all right. We'll take your word for it. What's his address? 632 Hill Road. Thanks. Uh, has Carl done something wrong? No, no. It's just a routine check. The reason I asked it, I was just thinking about something. What is it? My daughter Jane is making a delivery at his house right now. You know where it is, Dan? It's around Chavez Ravine. Thanks very much. That's all right. My wife was a lot like you. Your wife? Oh, I forgot. You didn't know I was married, did you? something very interesting to show you. Hello, 
Oh, Mr. Martin. What are you doing here? Shh. You're waiting my dog. Then you better go home and play. But you told me I could play any time I wanted to. I don't care what I said. I don't want you around here now. Go on. Go on. somewhere. Tea still warm. The girl's been here too. Check the back. Nobody out in the yard. Take a look at this. That's it, all right. There was a kid out front. Let's see what she knows. You know the man who lives in that house? That house. Who lives there? Would you like some gum? My mommy won't let me take anything from strangers. Your mother's right. What's your name? What's your dolly's name? Maria. That's a very pretty name. My name is Carmelita. That's pretty, too. What's his name? Mr. Martin. Do you know where Mr. Martin is, Carmelita? He's with the girl. Where are they now? Don't point at me. <laughs> Carmelita, go home to your mommy, please, honey. You won't say. I got it. Okay.
Welcome back. Now I'll tell you, that scene at the police station, that room filled with all those gorgeous blondes, <laughs> I'm telling you, I should have been a cop. <laughs> but the reason they were using them was the killer's victims all reminded him of his wife. And whether they were estranged, divorced, or she died, you know, that aspect was never answered. But Meg Randall, and she's the one playing Jane here, you know, the nursery owner's daughter. She was born in Clinton, Oklahoma, and though she was white, she grew up on or near Native American reservations. Uh, some of them uh, near like the Chickasaw Reservation, Seminole, Potawatomi, and Shawnee. Now, her filmography is very short. She only appeared in 11 films. Uh, even when she was under contract, studios often overlooked her and never assigned her any roles. And of course, there was always lots of competition. So uh, yeah, her filmography was very short. And of that 11 films, three of those were the Ma and Pa Kettle films. Uh, she was in three of those uh, in the role of Kim Parker Kettle. But some of the other notable films that she did appear in, she was in 1947's Stork Bites Man. Uh, she appeared in that with Jackie Cooper. 1949's The Life of Riley. In that, she was in with William Bendix, who was in last week's presentation cover-up. And her th other than tonight's picture, her three other noirs, she was in Abandoned, uh, she was in that with Dennis O'Keefe and Gail Storm. I brought you that one some time back. She was in Criss Cross with Burt Lancaster, Dan Duryea, and Yvonne DiCarlo. And she was in Chain of Evidence. Now remember, if you like old pictures like this, click on the subscribe button. You'll be notified of future releases up here in the notification bell. And you can always just click on the Full Moon Matinee icon down here, or just type Full Moon Matinee in the search bar, and you can find all of the prior releases. And, as always, I thank you for spending the evening with Full Moon Matinee. Stay with us as we continue our further investigations into the long-lost evidence of Hollywood. Until next time.